The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Good evening. Welcome to my state of mind. I am Dan York. With all of the heat in the kitchen locally on COVID and superintendents under fire in Providence and you name it this week, the Middle East has been on fire. And for the last couple of weeks, what's it all about? Americans, Southern New Englanders, Rhode Islanders, uh, folks living in the Commonwealth are certainly perplexed at times about, about this Middle East strife and conflict. So let's try to get some perspective here tonight with Ruth Ben Artsy, a political science professor at uh, PC. She's li- she's born in Israel. She uh, lived in Israel. She served in um, a, a a specific intelligence capacity in Israel. Uh, she's been teaching for more than a decade at PC. She has a perspective. Not a big fan of the Netanyahu government, but. Her context, I think, is uh, help and supportive. So you're going to meet her coming up in just a minute. In the meantime, recording on Thursday with a lot of things changing, here was the latest that we had on the story. Attacks have slowed overnight, and there's word a ceasefire could be near in the battle between Israel and militants in Gaza. An Egyptian security source told Reuters the sides had agreed in principle to a ceasefire after help from mediators. Details are still being negotiated in secret. This news comes after the White House says President Biden told Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu he expects a significant de-escalation on a path to a ceasefire. Explosions inside Gaza, though, could still be seen after daybreak. Israeli media said the strikes aimed at Hamas military installations had slowed compared to recent days. Israel's ambassador to the United Nations and the United States spoke exclusively to CBS News, saying the country is not fighting against Palestinians, but against Hamas. Look, we didn't seek uh, this conflict. In fact, we did everything in our power to stop it and de-escalate the situation. Yesterday, protesters in Arab countries marched in the streets and burned the Israeli flag. Residents of Kuwait, a country that does not allow entry to anyone whose passport has been stamped by Israel, says this conflict proves how far apart they are when it comes to peace. With someone who's killing uh, children and killing people in in Palestine, uh, we don't accept uh, normalization. The 193-member United Nations General Assembly is scheduled to meet today on the conflict. And so I'm really pleased to have a professor of political science whose focus uh, is the Middle East, uh, Professor Ruth Ben Artsy, who earlier in the week appeared on the radio show and wowed everybody with her ability to to bring context, uh, history, and kind of you know present day dynamics in, into this conversation. Professor, thank you so much for joining me. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Your uh, your conversation with me right here is actually being recorded on Thursday morning. And, you know, folks, it's one of those things where when you decide to have a, a current events conversation, it, things can change quickly and no more uh, true than what's happening in the Middle East. As we speak, uh, we're in day 11 of uh, the violence. Uh, you're watching this on Friday, Sunday, and it well could have uh, come to a ceasefire by then. But the bigger picture, I think, is still something that we should talk about. Um, at the risk of asking you to teach a class, uh, what's happened here? Um, so part of what's happened has to do with timing. It has to do with domestic politics, uh, especially for Israel. Um, We have seen the flare-ups in the region in the Middle East and between Israelis and Palestinians now for for years, every few years, um, uh, and especially between Israel and Gaza since uh, the the Gaza had, uh, Israel had quote-unquote separated from Gaza in uh, 2005. Um, This happens every few years with bombing and then rockets and uh, and, um, uh, between Hamas uh, and uh, Israel. It strikes me, especially with you know you being from the region, being born, raised in the region, having having worked you know in intel and all and, and and things that you're you're so that you're, I wouldn't say you're nonchalant, but you're you're fairly matter of fact about the idea. Well, you know, this stuff bubbles up every once in a while. Um, that's what I think. All of us are. You know, why does it have to? I mean, 
I don't think everybody's naive to the history of, 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 of how this conflict has begun, but the, it's kind of like, it's like, hey, you know, this kind of bubbles up every once in a while. Well, you know what? When I look at when I look at the video of, of, of children uh, dead, and when I, when I when I see families um, uh, and, and buildings and 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 dwellings and businesses crushed, and 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 seventy five thousand Palestinians displaced, Israelis who are you know living on the edge constantly. I just, I just find it, I find it uncomfortable to, to just move past this thing. Is that you know, you know, the bumper sticker blank happens. You know, it, it's you know what I'm saying. Right. So there's an occupation. There are 4.7 million Palestinians who live under occupation. They're not citizens of any country. There's no such country as Palestine. Gaza is not an independent country. Gaza has some sorts of autonomy. It had an election. It did vote Hamas. Um, uh, a while ago, um, a long time ago, there, there were supposed to be Palestinian elections coming up in June and they were canceled, partly because of Israel, not only, it's not only Palestinians' fault, um, but there's two million people living in Gaza who cannot leave the borders of Gaza, who are trapped inside in the most uh, highly dense populated area per square foot in the world. Um, so that's, that, that kind of gives you an idea of Gaza. Israel controls everything that comes in and out of Gaza. Uh, Israel controls uh, registry of everybody who's born and everybody who passes away or who dies. So death certificates have to go through uh, the Israeli government. So, you know, for people wondering, how does Israel know who to contact, how to contact, how to let people in buildings know that the building is about to be bombed, Israel has contact information for basically everybody in Gaza. So there is control over Gaza. There's control over the sea by Gaza, Palestinians, even Palestinian fishermen, which is some, there's, that's kind of a big um, part of their livelihood, can't go further than a certain, there's, there's um, Navy boats, Israeli Navy boats patrolling the coast of Gaza um, at 24 seven. So that's just kind of, that's, Gaza. So I'm including Gaza in the occupation since it should be part of a future Palestinian state that does not exist yet. Um, 4.7 million Palestinians live under military rule. As long as that's the case, there will be this violence. So no amount of normalization of relationship with Arab countries in the Gulf that Israel was never in a war with to begin with is going to change that fact. When you have 4.7 million Palestinians who are living in these conditions. So they're living from their perspective and, and for anybody who goes to visit where they're living, they're in a state of war constantly. Not only when there's flare ups, their day-to-day -day life, they're surrounded by, um, by Israeli soldiers, they're uh, in Gaza, there's, and also in the West Bank actually, um, they, there's intermittent electricity, water. They don't always have access to electricity or water. Sometimes it's just a few hours a day. Um, they're really fully under the control of the Israeli military regime. Uh, and in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, there's two different sets of laws. There's Jews who live in those territories who are citizens of Israel and fall under civilian jurisdiction of Israel. And there's Palestinians who are not citizens of Israel who fall under military rule. So the reason why I sound nonchalant about it is because even now when there's going to be a ceasefire, there's 4.7 million people. Um, it, there's going to be a flare up again. If the occupation doesn't end, this is not, this situation is just going to repeat itself over and over again. Okay. So um, I kind of jumped into a, a different space than you probably wanted to start with in terms of context and history. Um, but I can hear people's minds moving already, thinking, hmm, this professor is much more Palestinian empathetic than I expected to hear. True? You know, I don't label myself as empathetic to a certain group or other. I am definitely a supporter of um, various uh, human rights conventions and I pay attention to those things and to human rights being value violated and I uh, don't hold any prejudice. So if it's Israel, it's my country, I'm Israeli, I was born in Israel, I was raised in Israel, uh, I served in the Israeli IDF, I saw things with my own eyes. Um, 
I can be critical. Americans are allowed to be, crit be critical of their own country when they're, you know, some Americans were critical of the Iraq war, uh, of the Vietnam war. Um, this, the same thing happens in Israel. There's, it's not a monolith. And there are Israelis like myself uh, who are very much in opposition to not just to Netanyahu's government and to this very extreme right-wing government that he's headed. Right now it's an interim government. It's now uh, we just finished the, the fourth election. It's, it's still not conclusive who's going to be uh, prime minister or if there's going to be a, fi a fifth election um, coming up in a few months. Um, there's Israelis who are protesting against the government and, and or are very much opposed to what Israel, the Israeli government is doing right now, uh, just as happens in, in the United States. It's becoming increasingly more difficult in Israel. And those who are opposed to the government are um, find themselves under attack, and, and including journalists who are trying to report the facts are under attack. But in my role as an academic, in what, what I just had outlined about Gaza, about the Palestinian, about the occupation, okay. those are facts. That's evidence. That's indisputable. Uh, according to international law, those territories are not part of Israel. They are disputed territories. So the Jews who live in the West Bank live in disputed territories. They've never been recognized as part of Israel's borders. In fact, Israel has not recognized them as part of its borders because if it did, it would annex them and then it would have to deal with those 4.7 million Palestinians. What are they? Are they non-citizens in the whole territory that, is, that Israel considers its territory? Because that's when we reach that, you know, we start having to discuss apartheid or um, does Israel not want to deal with that and therefore does not annex, and this has been the policy up until now, does not officially annex those territories. And I, there is a precedent for this, actually, I should um, kind of, uh, just to clarify this, the Golan Heights, for example, which were conquered from Syria, um, the Golan Heights was annexed. And so the Druze communities and some Arab communities who lived or in the Golan Heights became Israeli citizens. So it's not that Israel didn't annex already territories that it had conquered in 67 or 73. It did. It just is not annexing the West Bank and it deliberately separated from Gaza. In fact, I myself was against that. It, it evacuated the very, very few Jewish settlements that were in Gaza prior to 2005, separated from Gaza. This was a tactical um, decision to be made. Okay, uh, we're going to pause here. When we come back, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about uh, what's happening this week in real time and uh, what the future brings. Is it just more, well, is it going to keep going? Stay with us with, uh, with Professor Ruth ben Artsy on My State of Mind. Back to My State of Mind. Ruth ben Artsy is Professor of Political Science in, uh, at PC, uh, focusing on the Middle East. She is Israeli. She's from, from there. She, she, she gets it. Uh, in a way that uh, most of us don't even have a comp, you know, don't even have a concept. Tell, tell me um, in, in as concise a manner as we can, what this conflict now, this, this round of battle is all about. Um, so there's two things. First of all, we were right up against the, during Ramadan, the, the holiest month for uh, Islam. And this is a time where uh, Muslims um, from... <laughs> Palestinian territories and from Israel um, uh, uh, go visit the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, Temple Mount in the old city of Jerusalem, um, which is under um, uh, their jurisdiction. It's under Jordanian jurisdiction, in fact. Um, and there was also a deadline, a Supreme Court hearing that was supposed to happen a week and a half ago, an Israeli Supreme Court hearing, about uh, specifically about nine homes in an East Jerusalem neighborhood. It's called Sheikh Jarrah. Um, that were set to be evicted from their homes. This is an ongoing dispute, um, protests in support of the Palestinian uh, families uh, in Sheikh Jarrah have been happening regularly since um, 2009. Uh, there's been a lot of reporting on it, it's been through courts, but this was going to be kind of this culminating Israeli Supreme Court decision that was going to basically come down on either whether these families need, uh, are going to be evicted or not. Um, this move had been criticized by the international community um, and, it, and it has been in, criticized within Israel by Israelis uh, and also by Palestinian Israelis. Um, I talked about the 4.7 million Palestinians living under occupation. There are about 18 to 20 percent of Israeli citizens within the 1967 lines within the territory 
prior to the 1967 war um, are Arab Palestinians. They identify as Palestinians. In fact, they're relatives of some of those people who live in the West Bank in the occupied territories. Um, because all of this was right during the month of, of Ramadan, we had seen a lot more support for those families. Um, the issue of Sheikh Jarrah has been on top agenda of, of human rights organizations uh, in the international community. And the combination of this Supreme Court decision, the holy month of Ramadan, also Monday, a week and a half ago, the, the, there was a celebration, what, we, what in Israel, Israelis call Jerusalem Day, which typically is celebrated by um, right-wing Israeli Jews who march through with Israeli flags through Muslim neighborhoods uh, in Jerusalem, in the old city of Jerusalem. And it always causes provocation, but at this instance, it was going to cause even more provocation. At the last minute, it was canceled due to, to, to pressure. But all of this bubbled up at the same time, including then because of the violence that erupted, the Supreme Court um, meeting was postponed. So it hasn't actually happened yet. All of this together flared things up. Um, part of it was deliberate, it seems, Israeli actions in the Al-Aqsa area, geographic area, where the mosque is. Um, the police, Israeli police and military entered that area um, for uh, Palestinians, uh, for Muslims, uh, this is a desecration, um, for unprovoked. So there, there was no reason for some of what was happening to happen. The Israeli military police at the last minute closed off and restricted um, the Nablus gate that leads to, uh, to the old city, to the temple, to the temple mount, to Al-Aqsa, um, something that has not done, had not been done before. There was really no reason giving, given for it. And it also stirred a lot of emotions. So all of this together um, with the fact that Israel is going through a transi transition in government and there was about to be signed a coalition agreement that would have put Netanyahu out of the prime minister's seat. So, Put that all together, this was a perfect storm, the violence erupted. Obviously, this alternative coalition that would have put Netanyahu out of his seat is, uh, fell apart. So that's not happening right now. And the violence continued um, and to a large extent provoked by Israel. Okay, so, so, so when we come back, we, we also, I think, have to point out in some context, or I'll ask the question, you know, Hamas ain't no great actor either. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that when we come back and, 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 and try to project where this is going. Stay with us. Science professor Ruth Ben Artsy from PC. Look, uh, we've we've really evaluated a lot of the Israeli perspective here. Uh, Hamas is no great actor. Uh, they're a terrorist organization, and you know the people want to know who the good guy or the bad guy is. I asked that earlier this week, and it's a very difficult question, I guess, to answer. But the you know the, the lack of recognition of Israeli existence or Israel's existence is it, it is a foundational problem here too, is it not? Um, I'm going to set that aside because in the heat of protest, slogans are being thrown by all Israelis who are pro Israeli Jews who are marching through Jerusalem, the right wing. Um, and what some people call the right-wing militias and who are also actually going into Arab towns in Israel and causing damage. Um, they were chanting death to the Arabs. Um, I don't think that's any better than um, non-recognition or, of, you know, okay. people don't, individuals don't get to decide whether they recognize the state or not. That's the international community. As a political scientist, I would say that that's the role of the United okay. Nations, not of individuals. Um, so um, Hamas jumped the bandwagon. Really, what happened here it, I, I just I described before this, uh, before the break, um, the kind of political conundrum that the right-wing government, the Likud government, Netanyahu's government is in right now in this transition phase. Um, there is sometimes nothing more helpful than a war to have an external enemy. Hamas is this perfect enemy um, to have, uh, to kind of unite everybody behind the government. Um, the bait was thrown. Hamas just jumped on the bandwagon because of what was happening in Al-Aqsa, because of what was happening in Sheikh Jarrah in East Jerusalem, uh, and decided to take that opportunity to launch rockets. That is unacceptable, obviously, and that is also a violation uh, of international law for Hamas to do that. Uh, but Hamas was, was provoked by Israel, took the bait, and in fact, I would say that the Israeli government 
this current transition government was happy for that to happen, was hoping that that would happen because the two groups that this um, uh, this latest row of violence between Hamas and uh, and Israel serves are the Israeli right wing government, the current transition government, the extreme right wing, and Hamas. They're the ones who are benefiting from this situation. And when you think about it, there's this asymmetry of power. Um, and you said you mentioned terrorist organization. Yeah, Hamas is labeled as a terrorist organization by Israel, by the international community, by the United States. It's it's an organization that is basically made up of militias. Israel is the fourth largest, most sophisticated military in the world. It is a nuclear power. Israel could have decimated Hamas a long time ago had it wanted to. So it's kind of an open secret in Israel that the Netanyahu government actually helps Hamas and secretly like enjoy benefits from Hamas outbursts like this one because it could then show a use of force and, 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 and come out, Netanyahu especially can come out as being tough on terrorism. You know, I, I, I only have uh, less than a minute. America's role is... America is already involved, and I, I said that earlier in the week on your radio show. America, uh, the United States um, gives a huge amount of aid, almost $4. billion a year to Israel, mil in military aid to Israel. Um, much of it unaccounted for. Israel doesn't have to be. Israel has a kind of a special um, relationship with the United States when it comes to aid. And unlike other countries that receive military aid from the United States, Israel that receives more than half of total U.S. military aid does not have to give that accounting. So this is why the U.S. is already involved in it, even if we don't do anything, we're already involved. And this is also where we have leverage. Yeah. All right. Uh, the, the, the saga will continue. I, I will ask the professor to join us uh, on the radio show as we go. And I'm sure we'll visit back here uh, in the near future. Professor, thank you for your, uh, your perspective and uh, your expertise on this. Uh, final word and we come back. Stay with us. It's hard to stay informed on our own stuff. Never mind that in the Middle East. But the Middle East is our own stuff. Remember that. We'll see you on the radio weekdays, 3 till 6 on WPRO. I'm back here next weekend. Thanks. Good night.